in a sitch in a potentially uh, life threatening and absolutely uncomfortable situation but am I willing to do that for freedom am I willing to do that because I think it makes the most sense very really if I say I'm someone who wants to be my own person if I want to be my own person and I want to be free essentially I want to make choices uh, what is it that I'm asking myself to undertake and to suffer for really and is that suffering worth it? Obviously, I ran away three times, so it was worth it to me. That was the conclusion I came to. It was very much worth it for me. And it's where I find... I don't agree with everything that John Paul Sartre says uh, in his existentialism. But I do agree with these. this uh, principle. As in, freedom is a burden. And our burden is intimately tied to freedom. Consciousness is a burden in of itself. It is not the fact that we are inadequate. It's not the fact that we're weak. It's not the fact that we're susceptible to disease, death, pestilence, uh, horrible motives, nefarious intents, fear, malevolency, um, impotency, uh, pain, ridicule, and abasement. It's not the fact that we're subjected to these things. It's the fact that we are aware and are so impressed by these things that we can mull over them, consider them, and project them into the future, um, contemplate them, and be ha and be fixed in states of trances that are uh, influenced by them, and watch ourselves spiral off into ruin or into chaos and. Be aware of suffering abundantly around us, around the world, or around, or, or with the ones that we love. It's the fact that we can uh, have a rational or really um, uh, verbal and pictorial uh, association to all the things that we experience. It's that we do experience. It's that we are aware of our experience which is the burden of existence because ignorance it's to just be cliche in some ways is bliss if one is not aware one has no volition the impairment of awareness is the impairment of volition as it is a fundamental principle of the justice system to be predicated on one's awareness or the ability to be coherent in terms of action and responsibility. Um, it's to say this, that um, very really our consciousness is our freedom, as in we can make choices and we can make decisions, but that is the pain of existence and that is part, that's part of the pain of existence, so that's part of the pain of life. I find it so interesting with in uh, Genesis that the tree of uh, the knowledge of good and evil is that which brought death that to know and to be aware to truly be aware and to be able to make a choice that does differ from uh, the divine will is the thing that brings the greatest amount of torment and uh, bearing of suffering and the ultimate penalty of death upon man it's consciousness and ultimately freedom because that's where freedom is housed as in there are quasi deterministic elements that are always about influencing and acting on us but we can sum up our will and our volition and means of thought and rationality and logic to take in impose nature and build constructions and uh, reconcile certain things make technology and uh, have insights and leaps in understanding per se just the school of scientific thought and rationality per se is not to say that it's uh, the savior of mankind but is a um, uh, faithful um, uh, servant though intuition be the be the gift um, rationality is the servant
um, the emissary of the master, per se. Now, it's just to say that freedom is a burden, and freedom always comes with the price of hypervigilance, that one has to always be aware and watching and uh, have a great deal of sobriety and uh, consideration to them if they are not to be um, pulled and persuaded necessarily mindlessly by things or to be uh, coerced or to uh, fall victim to oneself and uh, divisive elements and qualities and imperfect, imperfect characteristics per se. It's just that freedom is a burden. If you don't want to be a slave to self, if you don't want to be a slave to societies, if you don't want to be a slave to nature, if you don't want to be a slave to anything, if you don't want to be a slave, you have to have a strong amount of uh, vigilance to yourself, and that's taxing and that's tiring. Not only is that, but you take yourself and put yourself at harm's uh, reach. You put yourself at pain's reach. You put yourself at suffering's reach. You will be alienated, you will be pained, you will be suffering, you will not be comfortable, per se, in your existence. Uh, it's one thing I do find in Christianity that uh, Jesus said he was the way and the truth and the life, and if he is the way and the truth and the life, that suffering would come upon all that believed in him, because this world was the very anti antithesis of him and his father's will, as in this was a world owned by uh, Satan and uh, evil, uh, evil or immorality per se. Um, I don't think that, but I think that the uh, symbol and the um, uh, motif is important in understanding that very really, if you say that because in the uh, Christian uh, motif, we are a chain and we are in shackles and it is Christ that is the uh, agent of freedom per se or the liberator of the lost and the reviver of the dead in heart and soul. And so freedom is presented in Christ. Though very really, you know, there is no freedom. And this is one thing, not to harp on Christianity or anything or over talk it. There is this thing about that there is no such thing as sex, gender, race, or anything like that. All differentiation disappears in Christ. As in that we are just all one ho homogeneous thing. And there is no freedom in homogeneity. There is, there, there is only, it's a collusion. You are not an individual, but a piece, a mob, in a sense, an amorphous something to where no brain and nor no entity exists. It is only one brain, sort of like a Borg, per se. And um, it's that... Um, it's that um, uh, thing that I am just against in some ways, as I don't want to be assimilated necessarily into some whole. That's my repression of extroverted feeling. So that may not bother extroverted feeling types, but it's also this that... Um, in heaven, you will spend your time worshiping God, and that's what you will do. Or in heaven, it's just that if you go to heaven, I get to some schools of Christian thought, I think to the most standard Western school of Christian thought, that you go to heaven, and uh, if you're not Mormon or anything, you don't become a God. You're, uh, you don't become a God, but you're um, in the presence of God always, and you're enamored and, rap and enraptured in His presence. What that is, is like infinite entertainment, per se, or infinite awe and amazement. You will spend your time watching, staring, and singing praises. There is nothing else going on outside of your centering yourself around His Majesty. And I said one time when I realized this, I asked somebody, well, what if I want to go um, explore something? Well, you won't want to go explore something because God will be all you need. I said, then, I wouldn't be myself. And they would said, what do you mean? Well, I think that even if God is all amazing and transcendent, 
at some point, if I if the brain remains as it is in terms of its uh, relation to stimuli, God is a stimulus in some respects, and I'm going to take him in, though I can't take him in his totality, I am going to make a realization that I can't take him in in his totality and say that's wonderful, but I want to go look at this now and I want to go look at that now. I, will, I, will, I am exploratory in nature, so there's something that's going to be wrong with me if I'm not, if I don't have the impetus to pick up and go and go see and look at things or at the very least mess with things, um, I would want to build things. Being in a heaven where everything's constructed for me would be very boring. I would get bored in heaven. I really would. I don't, there's nothing about um, consistent, just over, uh, over consistency and stultification of things that is at all appealing to me. And the uh, complete provisional hand, as in everything's provided for me. I don't have to labor. I don't have to work. I don't like that at all. I d like utopias. The fact that we want utopias and things bothers me. I'm not a utopist. I hate uh, utopias. I find you, the idea of utopianism just a uh, another recasting of of uh, other worlds per se, and another redressing of heaven per se. I'm not uh, part of a people for perfect societies club. I'm a part of reasonably uh, reasonable expectations in terms of achieving equilibrated states and in societies and communities and groups and for individuals where individual integrity remains at the heart and the center and the focus of things as communities are the aggregation of individuals and not entities in of themselves. They don't have minds in of themselves. And they should not be respected in of themselves if not for the individuals that comprise them, per se, and their own individual experience. Very really, but I'm an INTP, so that's like, the, take that for what it's worth. But, uh, so I was not, I don't like uh, just that. I don't like that very really. And it's where in uh, the idea of existentialism that uh, you have to, if you don't want to um, just, you have to realize that if you want freedom, you can't be handed things. People are not going to take care of you. Um, you can't expect the uh, a generous hand per se just expect that things are going to be much, much harder. As in, when things were agrarian societies and there weren't centralized bodies of government and things like that, people toiled and labor was at the heart of things and we created technology to um, circumvent those things. But really with the advent of technology came a need for greater centralization and bureaucrat bureaucratic uh, structures and uh, organizational schemes per se and a new type of legislation and binding agreements, per se, and property rights and all, a whole lot of other interesting things that put a lace work in, uh, I say a lace work as in a very serious, uh, intricate network of restrictive properties and qualities towards life. As in, like, in this present day America, we have so much pleasure, per se, but we have even less freedom. And I hate that. And as a as a kid, I was just this is this that freedom. There is a very real price to freedom. The freedom does not come with pleasure necessarily. Freedom doesn't guarantee happiness. Freedom doesn't guarantee security. Freedom doesn't guarantee a lot of things that people want. But people would say I was an idiot for running away and things like that, and moving to California and just living a very tramp existence as a college student. Uh, who always gets in trouble in some way and is just always in uh, debt and uh, has a hard time paying rent and things like that because I don't want to work at McDonald's so I'll suffer in some respects for a greater future per se. But it's like, nah man, I don't care. Like, because I'm not trying to be happy. You can think I'm an idiot, you can think I'm crazy. Because I don't, uh, happy, one, I don't give a crap about happiness in, in a real way. It's not to say that I'm a human being, so... It's not to say that I want to be consistently sorrowful 
woeful and, um, uh, I guess, der downtrodden, deride, and perturbed at life. It's not as if I want to always be in that state. But I do not want this uh, type of bliss, envy, uh, not envy, but type of bliss, adulation, and gay that most people want, as in, I don't want to consistently be inebriated. I find that people that want to be happy all the time just want to be drunk on dopamine. I don't want a drunk existence on dopamine just because it feels good. I mean, I find that just so, so oh man, it's not, it's not any different to me than being like a grazing animal in very real senses in this way. That uh, cows, they just eat the grass and they move and things like that. They're fairly, I don't know what the cow's emotional state is, but if you're always happy, if this happiness is the point of life, and it's just the attainment of that, and you will live in that state for forever, you will never experience or feel anything. You have no freedom. You don't exist in that state. You don't have any contention in you. You have a very tight, linear focus to you, per se. You're narrower in your focus. You don't make good decisions. You're not able to access your rational mind. You're not able to make sound judgments whenever you're very elated. When people are happy, they don't make good decisions. That's why in sales, they do try to bypass your rational mind and get you to be as happy as you can be when they're talking to you and get you to associate that emotion of happiness with that product or with that sales agent so you'll buy from them because you don't make good choices. People do not make good economic choices when they're being happy. You, in fact, people don't want you to think when you're making sales, per se, because thinking is the complete antithetical agency to bliss, joy, and gay. Um, if anything, it ruins and dampens it and sometimes, or at least puts a constraint on it so you, put, uh, so you, so you know. Because I've experienced it where you can get... For example, mania is just a prop, an over, uh, a hyper propagation of dopamine, and that person essentially is really, 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 really excited and happy. They're really excited and happy. Well, the, when people are really excited and happy, they take more risk and they do very risky things per se, and they become very risk, um, uh, elated and attractive rather than avoidant. As in, you get. Happiness makes you dumb, very really. I've never, you know, I don't like, I don't like it necessarily. But really, but I'm not saying people don't have the right to be happy, as it's written in the Constitution. So if you want to be happy, fine, be happy. But the thing is, is just that um, freedom to me means more per se than happiness or comfort or anything like that. Um, and it was something that my sister says, because my sister knows I'm atheist. My grandmother doesn't. Um, as I won't tell her, cause, uh, she, it would break her heart, and I just spare her that. I am very truthful, like, if my, my grandma asks me, do I go to church and stuff, and I say, no, grandma, but I don't tell her that I think that she's wrong in all of these things, I just let it go, and I just, cause some, I love my grandma, so it's just not worth it, and it's not to avoid conflict, it's just that I know I would just disappoint the hell out of her. And her life has been disappointing enough, so I'm just trying to spare her that, per se. She can go to the grave not knowing something is how I see it. Um, uh, but, yo, and, but my sister knows and my mother knows, and it bothers the crap out of them. And my sister says, well, you're rejecting God's love. You're rejecting love, Joshua. That's what you're doing when you say you, you want to be free. Because uh, she doesn't like this fact that I'm saying I want to be free. She's like, that you want to be a heathen, really, is what she actually says it. That's what you're doing when you say that. And I tell her, well, then I'm rejecting love. I don't want love if it means I'm going to be not going to be free. I don't want to, like, you know, I don't want love if it costs me my freedom. I don't want anything if it costs me my freedom. I really don't want it. It's poisonous to me. Very really. <laughs> I hate it. Like, and the thing is, I know we make trades and we make concessions per se, but I, when I say freedom, I mean my own integrity per se as an individual. I don't ever want that thing to be affronted. And I will, even if you put me in an internment camp or a concentration camp, I, if I have to, if you, if you gotta kill me, kill me. I'm sorry. And if I, and if they're just saying they won't kill me, but they're gonna torture me for eternity, and it was something I thought about hell too. Like, if I'm going to hell and I'm going to be tortured for eternity, 
for being, uh, for wanting my own autonomy and maintaining my integrity, per se, then fine, I don't give a shit. Like, I really don't. Like, it's worth it to me. And that may seem irrational, and it is irrational, because I know the only reason I'm like that is because I'm an INTP. Like, I know, like, very really, I can try and bring up all the logic I want, but very really, I know that that's, that's the reason in a lot of ways, as it's a staunch, it's very stark and prominent disposition to me, as in it doesn't, it does not have the, uh, the impression of choice in me, whether or not I want to be this way, or whether or not these things affect me or impress me in this way. They vary certain actions of coercion, and when people try to influence me, or certain bodies of doctrine or bureaucratic structures, when they do try to act on me. I feel violated and imposed upon, and I hate that and want to resist it. I do, and that's because I'm introverted in nature. I know INTPs who are Christians. Um, I know there are INTPs who are Christians. So they don't necessarily think nor have the same uh, experience I have towards those things, probably because they don't conceive and conceptualize it the way I do. Um, that's because TI is subjective in some respects. But uh, it's just to say this, that I don't care. Freedom, though, is something to be valued. And it's, it is, um, yeah, it's one of those human, ex because I think the human experience is something that is an expression of freedom. I think creativity, or very really expression, is the exploration and the expression of freedom, per se. Uh, it's just that there is something about the human spirit that deserve well, I can't say that deserves, because it's not as if we deserve really anything, as in there's, like, not a value metric, but just that it desires and it demands freedom. At least my, if I have a soul, it demands freedom. I just, whatever, however the atoms are coming together that constellate this, this experience for me, it's like freedom or nothing. That's what it's after. And I, it gets me in a lot of trouble, but I don't care the trouble, the cost, the dislike, the hate. If I have to be a villain in some ways, man, I don't care necessarily. But freedom is important. It's why I'm an existentialist. But what the thing I want to warn people of is maybe you're not hyperly uh, set on freedom in an irrational way as I am. But one thing I'm noticing in American culture in many ways is the tendency to trade off freedom for comfort, to trade off freedom for pleasure, and to trade off freedom for various things. Freedom is the very thing that this country was founded upon. It's, centri it's centered around rationality, per se, and uh, thought. And it's what men died for and risked their lives for. It's something to be treasured and valued, per se. But in America, for money, for fame, for whatever it is, for its status or social cohesion, or comfort, or pleasure, or whatever, we will make ourselves the agents and the slaves, per se, to anything that promises any sort of elation, or tantalization, or tickling of our fancies, senses, ears, or whatever, we're abrogating our uh, freedom, and we're in a, and I think we're in a pleasure island scenario, like in Pinocchio, where we think that we're having all this freedom, because we're able to indulge every desire and um, uh, thing that we want, but really it's decadence and a uh, another form of nihilism, and we should be aware of it. And the apathy that exists in people and the lack of vigilance, it bothers me. The sensitivity and the unwillingness for conflict, per se, as social justice warriors always want to mitigate conflict, and the tumultuous nature of life, and the um, uh, explosive elements and unpleasant truths that exist in things. I am altruistic. I don't know. I mean, like, I like some things about egalitarian, but and egalitarianism. But I'm altruistic. I th believe in helping people and um, uh, taking and um, uh, being a. I think there should be structures established to um, uh, help people out of situations they didn't get to choose for themselves very really because life in a lot of ways 
is a dice roll per se in the genetics that one gets in the family situations that one finds themselves in in the communities that one finds themselves in so there should be a buttress per se that against nature in a way that's what can, cultures concede for to help people get have a bit of autonomy and freedom to them to decide if they want different from themselves and not to be the victims of quasi-deterministic biological constructs and fate, really. I think that that's the point of the egalitarian state. However, a lot of the other things that it comes with, I, I just can't get behind. The, like political correctness and things like that. I think very really that legislation and bureaucracy doesn't do anything for uh, public relation and that it would be much better for people to work out their differences in terms of argumentation and uh, meetings, per se, in private, not maybe private sectors, per se, but within homes, as in the Parisian and the Enlightenment era, that's how real change came about. And in the Civil Rights Movement, that's how real change came about, as in leaders met and talked and discussed things with regular, everyday people. And it wasn't this giant whatever. My, the point being that Americans, a lot of people, uh, don't want freedom. And uh, I think we need to be very careful in that. And that freedom is the most precious thing that there is in a lot of ways. Now, all things are, you know, get different personalities value different things. So some people may say love is the most precious thing that there is. But I would say this, that if you're willing to uh, be oppressed for love, uh, well, what good is it? <laughs> like, if uh, even choosing to die for what one loves is uh, a uh, something provided by one's volition and choice, very really. As in, one um, takes and realizes the brevity of the situation, as in they will lose their life, and one realizes the um, uh, importance that the individual has to them, so they will say that though this situation threatens me and puts great terror and fear in me, this person I choose is greater than the value of my life. And it isn't a choice, it isn't a place of freedom and rational volition, even in a rational setting, that one can make that choice. Freedom and rationality are important, but we have forgotten them and they're lost in some respects, and we don't care about them in the same way. And we say that we do, but forget what people say and look at what you do with your actions, per se, and um, what you want. If you want freedom, things can't be free. You can't, like, this idea of things being free, things have prices to them. You can't have everything, even. And there's limitations that are set, as there are paradoxical elements to everything in life. And freedom comes with a lot of turmoil and constraints in a very personal way. But I promise you, if you accept those things, you will not find yourself the victim of nihilism and totalitarian regimes. And I think very really that we're going to look up one day and realize we're in a very much of a brave new world situation because we were too lazy or we were too apathetic or we wanted security or we wanted our pleasure or we wanted something more than what than we wanted in terms of our natural disposition in being autonomous individuals and having somewhat of a natural inheritance or a biological inheritance to the right to freedom and the pursuit of freedom. That is something that is innate within humans as there is an exploratory circuit and a play circuit and a circuit that does sit there and say, I am here and individuals are there. Freedom is made up in our existence and if we deny it because there are other drives that are competing with the complex of drives that make it up as they do not have necessarily the same voice and they're an aggregation of things and aren't necessarily like the sex drive and aren't necessarily like hunger and aren't that foundational in the embodied sense of things. But if there's a real spirituality, it's realizing that the embodied things have their place and that the intrinsic or uh, emotional or cognitive landscape has its place and that's the thing you know a soul and spirit and you should not deny your soul its right to freedom you will lose yourself because you will not be discomforted you will not deal with hate you will not deal with dislike I'm not saying be like me 
but I'm saying consider things in some respects and what it is you abrogate or give up and really when you're making choices per se and what you choose for your entertainment what you choose to do where you give your money different things like that freedom demands vigilance and it's wrought with a lot of difficulty but I think it's worth it I so think it's worth it um, and so that's my video and um, thank you for watching